the computer. Oh, thank you so much, Jim. Yeah, we're like I said, we had to switch over computers here last minute. Um, okay, so I think we've got that handled now. Awesome. And I'm going to turn it over to you, Caroline. Thank you very much. Thanks so much for having me today. I'm really excited to talk to the folks in the Seneca Watershed, which I hope I am. Um, let's see. So I, if I was in the room, I would ask you guys to raise your hands whether or not you knew how to identify hemlock trees. Put them out in their room. So I'm just going to tell you how to identify trees very quickly, and then we'll move on. Um, hemlocks are one of the most common tree species in the state. Um, the, this is a map of where they are. The darker brown is where there's a lot, a lot of hemlock. You can see the Tug Hill region, northern Adirondacks, the Catskills, all are kind of our densest hemlock. But we actually have a lot in the southern tier and in the, in the, at the southern end of our Finger Lakes. They have this furrowed gray-brown bark that has a little bit of color when you look into the, into the splits. It's rough, it's furrowed, it's brown. The foliage is lacy and feathery and evergreen. The needles are these short, um, flat needles. The undersides have two white stripes along the bottom, which helps differentiate them from some of our other trees. Uh, they're shiny and dark green on top. They have rounded tips without a notch. And they are not opposite in the botanical term, but they're held in this like flat opposite arrangement, kind of like an X-wing fighter from Star Wars with that X shape. So they it, you see, as you can see looking here, some of them point a little bit up and some point a little bit down on either side of the twig. So they're arranged that way so they can catch the most light. Um, there's the white stripes underneath. The cones are small and round, rounded scales, brown when they're mature. And this is what the reason we're here talking about these today is that hemlock is considered a foundation species, which means that it makes the ecosystem that a bunch of other species depend on. They fill a really unique niche. They're one of our only shade adapted evergreen trees. If you remember that, those the way they hold their needles, they hold them that way to capture as much light as possible because they tend to grow in shaded environments. Um, those needles are specially adapted to be able to photosynthesize even with the little sun flecks that filter through a, a dense canopy. So they tend to grow in our gorges, along our rivers, down in those shady places, often on the, on the northern slopes. They support a big web of food species, food and habitat. There are about 400 species that live with hemlocks, many of whom also live with our hardwoods. But the hemlocks provide this really unique habitat. Um, in the winter time, if we had a real winter, in the winter time when it was cold, um, it can be much warmer under the protective evergreen canopy of those hemlocks that really helps block the wind. And um, there's a little less snow underneath that evergreen canopy as well. In the summertime, when it's hot, and muggy, um, that dense shade that the hemlocks provide uh, makes it so that the air underneath the hemlocks is up to 10 degrees centigrade cooler than the air directly above them. So in the summer and in the winter, these hemlock groves are a refuge um, for species from the elements. They're also called in some places the ever-feeding tree because as the snow builds up over the winter, it pulls down more branches for deer and other grazers to feed on through the winter. They're, they're a really important part of our forests. They also have a lot of, provide a lot of services to our aquatic ecosystems, which might be even more interesting to this particular group. Um, hemlocks help keep stream flow stable throughout the year, and they also help keep the water cool. Um, the stability of stream flow is because hemlocks are much more active than our hardwoods in the 
spring and in the fall when we have an overabundance of water landing on our on our landscape. And so they're actively taking up water in those periods where we have too much water. And then in the winter, when we experience those short-term droughts and it gets very dry, um, they're less active than the hardwood forests. They're doing all of their photosynthesizing and everything they need to do during that short summer season. Um, and so they don't use as much water in the summer when water is scarce. Um, so, but a master's student from Cornell did a really interesting modeling experiment where he looked at the changes in hydrology across 81 watersheds on the eastern seaboard with hemlock. And the ones that have HWA had much flashier streams. Um, flashier meaning that the, the flow goes up and down much more aggressively in the areas where HWA had already arrived. I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit with the HWA, but I'm guessing you can follow me. Um, they also do all the things that other trees do in that they're um, filtering out nutrients as they come through the landscape towards towards those streams. And because they're in our riparian areas, they do more of that than some of the other tree species do. So they help keep our freshwater cold and clean. The way they keep it cold is that that dense shade keeps the snow on the landscape later into the spring then it is held by the hardwood forests, which don't have any leaves. So you have cold runoff going into your streams later in the, into the spring when you have hemlocks in that watershed. They also provide dense direct shade when they're actually over your stream. And what we don't wanna do is to have our watersheds look like this. This is the Pisgah National Forest um, in the Southern Appalachians and all of those gray, gray, sad trees are their hemlocks, which were killed by this pest, the hemlock bully adelgid, which is an invasive pest um, that feeds exclusively in, in the United States on hemlock trees. But take a step back and think about hemlocks. Um, these are all the places in the world where there are native hemlocks, uh, mostly North America and Asia. And these two places already have HWA, some kind of hemlock adelgid. Um, they're all the same species. All the hemlock woolly adelgid are all the same species. They started here. They moved to the West Coast sometime in the last million years, but a very long time ago. And then they've just recently arrived in our glaciated landscape here on the East Coast, where we have two species. Um, the Carolina hemlock, which is not anywhere near New York, but is, a, as you can see, has a very restricted range in the south southeast, and then our beloved eastern hemlock. So HWA has been in New York for a while, started down in the lower Hudson area, moved up through the Hudson Valley, and then, um, and then moved north into the Adirondacks, and before that, west into the Finger Lakes. And if you look at the colors here, um, the very light tan, that's the, the oldest infestations moving up to the red, which is 2021 20, and later. Um, this was a really unfortunate finding up here in 2020 during the pandemic. And since then, we've realized that there's quite a lot of HWA already in that, those very dense hemlock forests in the Adirondacks. But you can see it's been in our area for a long time, um, since, since the aughts. And this is what the, what the Seneca Lake watershed looks like right now. All the red dots are confirmed HWA infestations. It's been here for a long time. You've probably seen a lot of sick trees in the watershed. Um, generally speaking, the infestation in the Finger Lake started down here and moved its way north. And we're just now starting to pick up some of the new infestations up here at the northern end of the of the lakes and in the Syracuse region, moving north and east from there. So what do we know about HWA? What is this bug? This is what it looks like when you flip over that, that twig and look at the underside, see those two white stripes on the needle? So you're looking at the underside of the twig here. Um, this is where HWA likes to hang out, probably because it's protected from precipitation. And these white woolly bundles are, are the HWA. 
right there. This is what these bugs look like if you strip away that wool and look at them under a scanning electron microscope. Um, this child's um, silly straw looking thing, this is their mouth part that they put down into the hemlock twig. And they use that mouth part to suck starches out of the tree. It's probably not the removal of the starches that kills the tree. It's probably the tree walling off each individual wound from each of these mouth parts. If you look back at this, you know, maybe if you have one or two HWA on your twig, it's not going to bother you as a tree. But when you have this many HWA, all those little um, scar tissue from each of these little wounds makes it so that you can't get your sap out to the end here to make new foliage, which is where hemlock trees make their new, new needles. And so once these needles age and die, then there's no new needles to feed the tree. And we think that's actually eastern hemlocks. Um, trees can die in as fast as four years if you, um, have, if you have four mild winters. And in the south, they were dying in four to 10 years pretty, pretty reliably. But up here in the north, where historically we've had colder winters, we've been seeing mortality that's more like six to 20 years. Um, in the last few years, when we haven't had a lot of cold winters, we've seen some more rapid decline and some pretty rapid spread because we don't have those cold winters that knock back the HWA populations a bit. Two generations a year for HWA. There's the overwintering generation. They lay their eggs in the late spring, early summer, and then they hang out in a, almost like a hibernative state. It's in the summer, so we don't call it hibernation, we call it estivation, but it's the same general idea. They wake up in the fall, grow to maturity, lay their eggs in the late winter. And then there's a generation that doesn't have this estivation stage. They just, they don't, they don't go to sleep at all. They just go grow right through and lay the next generation's overwintering, the next year's overwintering generation. Um, in the native range of HWA in Asia, they actually have two trees that they live on. They do only asexual reproduction on hemlocks, and then they have a actually three more generations that go off and do sexual reproduction on, a, on an Asian spruce that we don't have here. So all of the reproduction in North America is asexual. All the HWA in North America are female. So they hatch out of their eggs as these tiny, tiny little crawlers, which is the only stage in which this pest is mobile. They crawl around, crawl onto the onto the feet of a bird or just get blown in the wind to a new location. Um, to find a good place to settle, stick those mouth parts into the tree, and that's it. If they get dislodged after that, they actually die. So this is the only time when you can move HWA from one, one place to another. Once they settle in the summertime, they go into that estivation phase and they look like this. Um, these are very blown up pictures of a twig. You can see how huge the needles are. And that's how small those over summering, estivating um, HWA are. They're very, very small and kind of hard to see. And in the fall, they wake up, start feeding, growing, and making more wool. And this is when they're easy to see in the winter time. See, this is the this year's new growth on this on this hemlock twig. There's last year's old falling apart HWA wool from long dead HWA. And then these are this year's actively growing um, live HWA. Each adult lays 50 to 100 eggs. And the fact that we have asexual reproduction, so one insect arriving in a stand can start a new infestation, two generations a year, two opportunities for exponential growth, and no native HWA predators. That's why we're having this outbreak condition where this pest is killing so many of our trees. How do you manage this pest? I'm happy to report that this pest is much more manageable than emerald ash borer. Um, you can treat it after it's arrived. Uh, it doesn't kill trees in three years. So you have more of a window to notice what's happening and do something. And treatment is much less effective. 
expensive. And there are two options for treatment. Chemical treatment, where you are just protecting the tree um, by, by killing the HWA on the tree and giving it some time to recover. And biological control. And you can think of this as chemical treatment is the short-term solution that's going to save your trees today. And biological control is the long-term solution that will save the, the eastern hemlock forests in the long term. We have two options really for treatment of anything bigger than a hedge. Um, imidacloprid is a slow-acting chemical. It takes about a year and a half to become a year to a year and a half to become effective and start managing HWA in your tree. But then it lasts for three to seven years. We usually say if you're gonna retreat, probably a five year um, calendar is, is a good idea for retreatment. It's widely available um, for use on trees. It is, um, I'll talk about that a little bit more later. The other op option is dinotefuran. This is a fast acting chemical. It starts killing hemlock woolly within a few weeks, but it's done in a year. And it can only be applied by certified pesticide applicators. Um, if you have very large, very old trees, very heavily infested trees, um, or you, those are really the two situations in your watershed where I would encourage you to use both of these together. There's really no reason to use dinotefuran alone. It's much more expensive than imidacloprid. That doesn't last as long. So um, if you get on top of what's happening on your property and treat it quickly, um, you can just use imidacloprid, which will be much less expensive than using both. The only other reason you would use both, which would apply here, is if you have a long at hemlock scale, which is another hemlock pest. If you happen to have that in your forest, you probably want to use both because dinotefuran manages that pest and imidacloprid doesn't. How can you apply this? Um, there's actually a bunch of different ways, only one of which you can do yourself, but there are a bunch of them if you're going to hire a site applicator to do it. If you're going to apply this to the tree itself, there is the most commonly used method in New York, which is basal bark application. We apply it to the trunk of the tree, it absorbs through the tree and gets moved through the, through the trunk and gets uh, moved throughout the tree into the canopy. Um, if you're immediately over water or close enough to water that you're uncomfortable having doing that, um, stem injection is the most expensive method, but it is also the most direct and specific to the tree. So if you want to be very careful with where your um, treatment goes, the stem injection is probably your best bet. And um, a lot of our partners do that when they're right near um, a stream because they really don't want that medical be getting into this. You can also apply this to the soil. Um, there's a soil drench where you pour it around the tree. Um, there's soil injection, which um, instead of pouring it, you you stick a, like a needle into the ground and inject it down below the surface. And there's a time release tablet, which is really great in remote areas where you're far from water and um, using a, a liquid mix is, is less practical. We've had partners use these in old growth forests where they were on a steep slope and they needed to hike in to get there. They use those time release tablets to protect those big old trees. Uh, mostly in New York, we do basal bark application. This is a gentleman doing that in the Lake George watershed, I believe. Now, if you want to treat the trees that are on your property now, if you want to protect those trees, chemical treatment is really the only option um, at this time because all of the biological research that's happening across the East Coast and in our lab here at the New York State Health Initiative is still in the research phases. So these 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 predators are not going to protect your trees now. This is a long, but it's a long-term solution. It would be a landscape scale solution if we can get it figured out, which we are hopeful that we will. Um, we are working with two different kinds of insect, both of which are predators on hemlock woolly adelgid. Um, the first one is Laracobius beetles. 
These guys are from mostly from the Pacific Northwest. They feed on that overwintering generation of HWA. We've been working with them since 2009, and we have beetles established at more than 11 sites now. I think we're up to 15 um, as of right now. We, we found we found some more established sites this past fall. That's what they look like um, on a twig eating HWA. You can see they're very small, but they're their, their um, food is even smaller. And these are the release sites in New York. And I'd like to focus your attention in here on Seneca Lake, where you, these stars are places where we have established um, there are copious beetles. So your watershed has these beetles out there in the landscape eating HWA, which is, which is awesome. Um, the other class of insects that we work with are silverflies. These are also from the Pacific Northwest. They feed on the spring generation of HWA, mostly the eggs of HWA, and they've been doing, we've been working with these since about 2017. Here's a little zoomed in look at what's, what we've done in the Seneca Lake watershed. So again, all of the red dots are where HWA has been found. Um, the yellow dots are Laracobius releases, and then these blue dots are Leucotaraxis, the silverfly releases. Um, we have not successfully identified an established population of the silverflies yet. We are still working on it. They're a little harder to, to sample for than the beetles, and that's a whole other talk that we would be happy to give you some other time if you'd like to learn all about finding finding biocontrols in the landscape. Uh, we, the Hemlock Initiative, have a request for landowners and land managers within the Seneca Lake watershed who now have these beetles out on the landscape. Um, we know that they're well-established. Um, let me go back up back here. Uh, this is the Glenora Glen uh, ravine. Uh, we did a release in Glenora Glen in 2009, one of the very first releases we did in New York, um, established right here in your watershed. And we know that they're established there and we know that they've, they've, the population has grown out from there a little bit, but we don't have sites uh, to visit to, to see how far these biocontrols have spread in the watershed. Um, I think we also have establishment here at High Tor. So we've released here in 2009 and 2020 at Sawmill Creek here in 2020, um, Texas Hollow in 2020 and 2021, and also an older one, the Watkins Glen um, release is fairly old. And then way out here, this is Mossy Bank, we released there in 2020 with the silver flies. So we'd like to be able to track these biocontrol populations. And what we, we would love to develop a list of landowners who are willing to either let us visit your site um, once or occasionally uh, to do some sampling, to look for these biocontrol insects, or to ship us some hemlock twigs from your property where we can just monitor those twigs and let you know if we find any, any of our biocontrols. So if that's of interest, um, drop a note in the chat with your email and, and I'll connect you with the gentleman here in our lab who is working on that. So let's talk for a few minutes about management, planning hemlock conservation on your property or in your watershed. And the big question is, especially at the southern end of the lake where there's a lot of hemlock is which trees, which trees do you save? You probably have there's a lot of there's a lot of hemlocks in the watershed. We probably can't treat them all. So, which ones do you focus your time and attention on? Which stands are most important to conserve? And then, which ones do you treat first if you have limited funds? What treatment should I use? Dinotafurin, imidacloprid, both, something else? Um, which trees do I treat in the stands that I've picked? So for that big question, which stands are most important to conserve? If you think of this as looking out across 
your property or across your landscape and saying, let's set aside where the HWA is right now and just think about which stands are most important to keep on the landscape moving into the future. This, we have a tool, we have a tool for that. Um, it's the stand conservation tool. If you're just working on your own property, you probably don't need this, this Excel file. You probably just need to look through this um, prioritization document. We'll just walk you through all of the things that um, people think are important for conserving hemlocks and help you think about your property and which one of those different pieces is most important to you and where they apply on your property. If you are doing uh, multiple properties or trying to defend why you're treating on one property and not another property, then you would probably want this tool where you can assign numbers to the different traits of the stands and come up with a, a, a ranking so that you can say, see, the, these stands are more important and here's why. Um, so the very first part of that is just a decision tree that says, if you're at the leading edge of an infestation, which you're not, Zeneca Lake, go ahead and treat. Uh, if you have an old growth remnant, which you might have, or a very nice prior, you know, really nice forest with not too many invasives and big old trees, go ahead and treat that. That's important. And if you're likely to take these trees out for some reason or another, don't, don't treat. Anything else you could send, go ahead and think about all the different metrics that you might want to think about. Um, if you're looking at many different properties or you decide to think about Seneca Lake and Cuca Lake watersheds as a whole and come up with a regional con hemlock conservation plan, then you would want to do a two-stage process. And the first thing that you would do is figure out where your hemlocks are, probably by looking at an aerial map and um, um, circling where the conifers are, especially if you know their hemlocks. And then pull together a team and do some surveys to, to figure out how healthy those stands are. Is there HWA there or not? Um, is there any, what, what, are, what are the important things about these stands? And then you plug in the information into the tool, figure out where your important stands are, and then you have this really nice proof that you've thought through your plan, which you can provide to a funder to say, hey, we want funding to treat within our watershed, and we've thought this through, and we have a plan. Please help us fund, fund men, conservation of hemlocks in our watershed or whatever. Once you've decided where you're gonna treat, the next question is what treatment should I use? I actually took this photo from Virgin's um, Zurich Bog, which is uh, north and a bit west of you guys. This is a really interesting situation where you have hemlocks and you see this big gap here? That gap is there because the water table in this bog is really close to the surface. And that's what causes this gapping. This is not a place where I would use a soil drench method for applying chemicals because the water table's right up there, you know, right, right below the surface. That's not a great situation for, for any kind of soil application. If I were treating here, I would be using the, one of those stem applications, either a stem injection or the basal bark application. I believe these guys are going for basal bark application. Um, if you're working in a really remote area, you probably would lean towards those core te tech tablets, the time release tablets. Um, if your funding is really limited, then you might, and, you, and you're not in a situation where you have water right there, um, maybe that soil drench method, which is by far the, the least costly, maybe that would be the way to go. Um, we talked with the homeowner who has, who has 60 acres of hemlock right near Lake Ontario, but not literally adjoining the water. And she decided to go for the soil drench because she's a teacher. She doesn't have a ton of funds and she wants to save those trees. Um, what trees do I treat? If you're looking at the stand, 
I'm trying to figure out which ones would you treat first. Um, probably the biggest ones first would be my recommendation. But you might want to make sure that over the, you can only treat so many inches of tree a year. And so you'll probably be treating for a few years if you want to cover a lot of the trees in your forest. The upside to that, that is that it spreads out the cost of management over several years. So it's much easier to budget for. Um, so maybe in the first year you'd go through and treat all the big trees. And then the next year you'd go back through and make sure you've got some big trees and some medium trees and some big trees just so that you preserve some of the stand structure within that. Um, that's usually the approach that people we work with use. Uh, also, any trees that are near your house, near your driveway, um, on a public trail, anything that's going to be a hazard if it dies and then falls, that would be an important tree to treat. The place that you'd like to take your family to picnic in the summertime, treat those trees. If you're thinking about a regional project, um, like if you were gonna look at your whole watershed and make a plan for how you're gonna conserve hemlocks in that watershed so that you can protect the quantity of water going into the lake and the quality of the water going into the lake um, by conserving those existing forests. Um, the first thing you'd wanna do is pull together a regional group, of people that care about the lake and, um, and wanna and want to protect the water quality into the future. Um, and then reach out to prior hemlock property owners and see if they'd be interested in allowing you to survey on their property. Build a survey team, survey, go through that scoring thing and then apply for funding. There are several groups who are doing this in New York. Um, at the at the Regional scale, both the Slilo Prism and the Adirondack Prism are um, working to figure out where survey is most important and do those places first. They all both have just small infestations right at the southern edges, so it's easier. Um, the Lake George watershed is now getting ready to do a, a much more serious prioritization of their properties now that they are realizing that they have too too much HWA to contain. Um, Skinny Atlas Lake has successfully applied for and secured, I think, two rounds of funding to treat hemlocks in their watershed. The Owasco Lake watershed has just completed a three-year grant to they've treated tens tens over ten thousand trees um, in the Owasco Lake watershed with those funds. Um, there's a group in Livingston County that's trying to pull together some funding. Um, Hanyoi, it's actually, I think that's Ontario County, um, Soil and Water Conservation District, secured some funding to do treatment in that watershed. And then uh, there's a, another group in Erie County that's looking for funding as well. So all of these guys, all of these people have pulled together regional projects to try to protect often a lake or, um, or the forested landscape in their region. So final thoughts, slide for many years. And I have always said, now survey and plan in the near term, hemlock conservation is critical and long-term biocontrol will move us forward. And I think that's still generally true, but in this particular instance in the Seneca Lake watershed, you have a lot of HWA in the watershed. Um, and it's, we, we may be past this. This might be really the immediate thing is figuring out how to conserve hemlocks before they are gone and getting them treated uh, now is really, that's, that's where I think Seneca Lake is at with their, with their hemlock conservation. And then we have this really active biological control research project in your area, and we would love it um, if we could work together to see what's going on with biocontrol in the watershed. That is my talk. 
I see there are some chats. Hopefully they're not saying that 